So, welcome again, after that short intermission, uh, for our second session with Shintaro Miyazaki. Shintaro is a senior researcher at the Critical Media Lab in Basel at the Academy of Arts and Design there in Switzerland. And he studied uh, media studies, philosophy and musicology in Basel, but also here in Berlin. And actually, we also have a history together, Shintaro and me and uh, CTM. We've worked on, uh, uh, together on a few occasions and we're happy to have him back here at the festival. Shintaro is especially um, dealing with, I would say, um, the politics of algorithms and has been working on these topics for many years, uh, trying to find ways how we can somehow uh, get out of the ignorance of being um, yeah, somehow subjects of this algorithmic infrastructures that captured, capture us. And in this talk here, he wants to discuss his concept of counter-raving or counter-dancing, which I understood as a attempt to yeah, f find um, ways how we can have critical and responsible uses of technology, but in alliance with dance, movement, our bodies, sound, beats, rhythms, uh, practices that we also know from our musical uh, scenes and lives, uh, from our music practices, and to use that liminal states that are possible there uh, to find an opening out of that capitalist condition that we are in at the moment. So please welcome Shintaro Miyazaki. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jan, for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. I'm a very great fan and follower of CTM uh, since 15 years. Um, yes, yeah, so today um, I try to plug in with uh, this uh, network and sort of discursive superorganism we are trying to form, also with the later speakers maybe and uh, modulate the idea of the liminal, uh, liminoid states uh, with this idea uh, Jan already mentioned uh, about counter-raving. So, um, but before deepening um, the concept, let me begin with some basic notes. So firstly, um, something grammatical. Um, I, I, I will say a lot of we and us and our, and I mean it, uh, whenever I do this, I mean it sort of inclusively uh, meaning that, you, that I ask you a little bit to imagine at least to take part at this V, and then uh, also, but also like uh, respecting um, obviously also different opinions inside our V, of course, and um, then you could say the difference between this us and the others are also like dynamic, right? So, and then this kind of um, drawing lines um, is um, important, but they need to to stay uh, movable and shiftable. But still, without these lines, we can't do any sort of critique or uh, become constructive. Secondly, uh, my reading tries to address more a sort of a feeling and tactical attitude or ethics, so it, there are no concrete examples, no um, projects. Um, certainly, my contribution is also intended not so much as an academic contribution, but more as a sort of attempt to express some rather new ideas through a gest gesture of searching. So, Jan said, I'm working on politics of algorithm, but this is a rather new, for me, a rather new thing, like the last two, three years. Before, I was really more interested in how algorithms work and more of what the, uh, the, in a playful sense. And now I think it's really important to think about them politically, right? And obviously my arguments also will draw a lot of circles and some passages will be variations of earlier ones. And fourthly, I will show sometimes um, uh, visuals uh, which are partly like screen recordings of me looking up keywords or names in a browser, uh, watching YouTube videos or scrolling through a PDF. And this is a very flashy um, meme-inspired high-speed like GIF. So they might appear kind of aggressive and distracting and totally in op an opposite uh, towards my idea. Uh, but um, I, I, for me, they are sort of reflective and maybe 
even ironic um, ways to show you through a visual side channel uh, the context of what you are listening to at the moment. So it's a, it's a side channel, the visuals, and the reading is the main channel. So if the pictures become too dizzy for you, please uh, close your eyes or look away. And uh, finally, I made this kind of uh, collection of links and with materials because maybe those videos are really too fast and then, um, yeah, this is maybe another way also to, um, to reveal some, some uh, more materials. Okay. So let us remember that in the last five years, even in the last few months, this was addressed already, we have been witnessing many glimpses of a kind of sinister, futureless world, right? Uh, with more war, more oppression, more exploitation, and uh, even the continuous triumph of Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Counter-raving is many things at the same time, but first and foremost, it is a form of raving against this sort of futureless, dystopian structures emerging in front of us. More concretely formulated, it is a form of raving against the congestions and bottlenecks and limitations imposed on us by these extractive networks of the techno and infosphere, and especially their algorithmic and computational systems. So counter-raving resonates with an attempt to keep evolving in liminal states, and it's a practice. And as Jan already mentioned, it's kind of this idea to, to have an alliance with dance movements, and bodies, things, and so on, but also like uh, technology. So, and by counter-raving, this is the idea, we can hopefully get a kind of a glimpse of a gateway and upon opportunity to go beyond, below, and besides um, capitalism. So, what I propose then here sounds a bit counterintuitive, but is the idea that in order to sort of decouple from the technosphere, we also need to uh, relink to it or rebound to it, you could say. So, still, while it is clear that during the last century we continuously got alienated from not only from nature but also from technology, um, it is still an open question. So you could say we, we, need, we just need to learn more about these technologies and the environment and uh, you know, the suffering of the world we created um, and we should feel more compassion with it. Um, not only with what's happening ecologically, but also what's happening on a technological side. Um, but this sort of pro pro problematization surely might help, but maybe it yeah, also might help to change our every everyday habits and behavior a bit, but still is not enough to reach kind of a critical mass considering the longer time scale, um, maybe of decades to come, right? So. Some people say, um, some comrades say, even um, this sort of awareness raising is uh, maybe more depressing or hindering than convincing. So counter-raving is therefore imagined as a sort of therapeutic and ironic maneuver against this form of um, techno and echo depression, if you will, and an attempt to dance uh, more like a joyful awareness raising. Yeah, it's sort of kind of maybe paradoxical, but it's, this is the idea. As an idea, it is um, uh, still to put into practice. It is um, in inspired by many uh, predecessors, projects, and movements, such as uh, RC sound system, acid communism, algo raving, um, disobedient electronics, E-toy, electronic disturbance theater, all this kind of, um, or also critical engineering, um, all this kind of tec techno-critical movements. And then the idea is to blend this somehow with the early vibes of the, um, of the techno music uh, movement, right? As an emancipatory political movement. It is a group and community-oriented gesture and built strongly on the dynamics of collecti collective happiness and its mobilization. Counter-raving is catching only to let us go and evaporate again. And it op operates not only in the realm of social imagination, you could say, but something we could call social sounding. Counter-raving is about reprogramming the code space. 
a concept formulated by human geographers Rob Kitching and Martin Dodge. Code space, I quote, occurs when software and the speciality of everyday life becomes mutually constituted, that is produced through one another. Here, speciality is the product of code, and code exists primarily in order to produce a special uh, particular, particular speciality, end of quote. So one of their examples is a check-in area in the airport, which when the software crashes obviously gets kind of turned into a fairly chaotic uh, waiting room. It gets dysfunctional. And in code, code space, the production of space is dependent on code. Right. So, and counter-raving here is the wish to create sort of an alternative, alternative code spaces, which are not designed fully for profit generation, like the, the check-in area or like the supermarket, um, also like a check-in or cashier um, place, but like more of a place where we can feel like um, solidarity, um, do stuff together. And this idea is not only, it's not some, it's not based on kind of a counter hegemonic ideology, you could say. Follow here an idea by um, Maurizio Lazzarato, as explained by Mackenzie Walk, but it's kind of a, a quote, means of producing a new kind of mesh of both machines and subjects, end of quote. Counter raving is an operation against what he called machinic enslavement which is the old conventional kind of machine-human link, and makes, I quote, desubjectivized de flows and fragments, and turns those subjects into component parts of machines, so slave units in the cybernetic sense, end of quote. So counter-raving wants to connect with machines, but tries, to, yeah, this is what, we don't want to get slaves, right, obviously. So, you could say, yeah, at least we want to take over or weaken certain vectors. This is an, another term, as Mackenzie, again, Mackenzie Walk calls it. So vectors meaning the operators which control the gradients and directions of um, flow and flows of all these informational processes. Um, and they produce um, knowledge and services. So basically you could say vectors create sort of asymmetric um, information situations. And these vectors, they are everywhere, right? And, and this is how, this is sort of, as Walk says, says this is the new capital. Um, yeah, Walk calls those, those who own these vectors the vectorialists class and those who create them the hacker class. So hackers here meant in a kind of broad way as a sort of creative technologists working in startups, think tanks, but also academics, journalists, activists, and artists. Basically, maybe all of us here today. So counter-raving unfolds in a dynamic, non hierarchizing never-ending gesture, movement, and dance of eternal search. Therefore, it, it is also to change the beat from time to time. So let's try to forget about techno-utopianism or so-called progress, and technology never solves a problem. It only differentiates it in a Deridian meaning. It brings it away from us, but for, from far away, it will still haunt us. So, and this kind of movement out, uh, technocrats call this kind of uh, movement the exter externalization, and Marxists, obviously, alienation, right? And this theory of counter-raving I'm trying to formulate here is also like inspired by uh, Felix Gattari and Gilles Deleuze, and it resonates with the principle of, this we heard again, heard maybe already in the university or somewhere, but it's interesting to take this up again at this moment, I think, uh, namely this kind of the, the rhizome, right? The rhizomatic action. So rhizomatic raving links oneself's joys and desires coupled with capitalistic technology with those of others in a flat manner. It evacuates, empties, and distributes accumulated energy 
tensions and power of, and money in a non-violent dance. So it involves kind of this careful dismantling of individual entities in our environment, which are not the same as their erasure, but rather about, I quote, opening the body to connections that presuppose an entire assemblage, circuits, conjunctions, levels, and thresholds, passages, passages and distributions of intensity and territories and deterritorialization measured with the craft of a surveyor." End of quote. So it's about map making maps. So while making new maps, new choreographies, and new compositions, it is also crucial to learn and train, I quote them again, deleuze Gattari, the art of dosages, they call it. So since overdose is a danger. So opening up one's body and mind to linkages or to, to link with the malicious and toxic technosphere is done only in order to counter it, to rhizomatize it, to make it queer, decolonial, you could say, non-patriarchal and ungraspable. And in the theory of Deleuze Gattari, um, schizophrenic. And Donna Haraway's Ironic, this is another famous concept, right? Donna Haraway's ironic concept of the cyborg from 1985 helps here since it suggests, I quote, a way out of the maze of dualism in which we have explained our bodies and our tools to ourselves, end of quote. The cyborg, I quote again, is an imagination of a feminist speaking in tongues to strike fear into the circuits of the super savers of the new right. It means both building and destroying machines, identities, categories, relationships, space stories." End of quote. And the late Michel Foucault's notion of critiques and uh, critique adds another twist into this stance of counter wave, um, because it is about the limits that are imposed on us by discourse and technologies, and especially computational nowadays, and Therefore, I quote, the critique is kind of an experiment with the possibilities of going beyond these um, limits, end of quote. So this sort of experimental critique which attempts to treat those instances of discourse that articulate what we think, say, and do as made by history, thus changeable. And also, again, this idea of gateway, gateways to introduce change. Counter-raving also resonates with this, all this cut, um, critique of capitalism, but, now the video is not working, but I had, had a video explaining, um, this, is my, this is the latest um, interest thing saying I came across is the, this idea by Mackenzie Vork that, cap, that we have now something, something even worse than capitalism, right? This is the new book title of him. Um, and this sort of um, critique is imagined as being conducted um, also by this mapping I was mentioning already, but also um, obviously also coding and programming machines and making sort of um, music machines and software. And this as a sort of therapy by coding. And this could act out as a sort of improvisation also. This implies the formulation of a crit critical pedagogy which enables to raise a critical mass of tech-savvy counter-ravers yet to come. So you see this idea of counter-raving, it's, it's just an idea, it's just well, maybe something for the next five, ten years. So let's remember again uh, Deleuze Gattari uh, to dance and rave, uh, rhizome-inspired structures aims to avoid making tree-like forms. So the tree is the hierarchy, the fixed hierarchy, and the rhizome is try to, trying to evade this. Therefore, we chant, we want to network, we want no hierarchization of its nodes. We want equal distribution, no concentration of power. No accumulation of outrageous amounts of rectorial power, money, data, and wealth, and maybe even joy and happiness. 
we want to address the inherent biases and gradients of and vectors coded into both the advertising networks of social media and algorithmic governance used by powerful companies and precarious governments. This was already mentioned by Emil. And we plan to tackle this by engaging with all sorts of means, maybe uh, these are just ideas, adversarial face and voice recognition analysis, or the uh, automatic decision-making algorithms used to filter, categorize, and govern the quality, flow, and supply, and logistics of masses of people, organisms, and things for control and for exploitation, right? And, and so on. You could also think, go into the, the game realm and think about how you could, or I, I really was intri intrigued by this game, the metaphor of the, how is it called, the non, non-playing um, character, and um, just how, how we could um, raise awareness in, in this kind of way, but still like with, uh, with joy. Another guy who is really important for this kind of idea is um, Franco Ber uh, Berardi, and he says that we are kind of, he's a little bit pessimistic, and optimistic at the same time. He says, by living in this suffocating, briefless, subordinating world, all we can do is to empower ourselves with uh, more poetry. So poetry always has a rhythm, you could also say, and this links um, this theory also to the late Henri Lefebvre's rhythm analysis. So inspiration as briefing in forms an upbeat an opening and the beginning of a rhythm. And by this also, this rhythm making, dancing, also enables one maybe to connect to the environment because you could just say uh, dancing creates uh, heat and, and transpiration into our environment. Everyday cities obviously have, um, have rhythms. Machines have their rhythms. Financial markets too. And this rhythm analysis, this method by Henri Lefebvre, is sort of the, you could say, the Marxist way of um, time series analysis, this kind of engineering way, and wants to operate similarly like a psychoanalysis or even schizoanalysis, but listens more to the timing of the capitalist networks. And as conceptualized more recently by, my, by myself, um, the analysis of algorithms, you could say, um, is uh, algorithm analysis, which means it's, it's kind of a variation of rhythm analysis in the urban scale, but with a stronger focus on algorithm-driven ramifications of profiteering, computational information networks, and so on. And just to make clear this idea, an algorithm is a cacography of algorithm, the way engineers and information technologies are calling step-by-step step instructions written in some coded form so that some machine can operate, execute, and compute them automatically. Right? This is the normal way, sort of. And, and with algorithm, as I have um, extensively, extensively written in earlier works, I intended to emphasize the, the rhythmic mode algorithms operate. And this is maybe also in resonance with Emil's idea about the tone or the vibe, uh, and yeah, because rhythms are, al are also always carnal and phys physiological, effective, and not mere chains of machinic pulses. And the, the rhythm, again, I started with Berardi, and brings me back again to him. So rhythm, he says, rhythm is the inmost vibration of the cosmos, and poetry is an attempt to tune into this cosmic vibration this temporal vibration that is coming, coming, and coming. End of quote. And you could say this also changing, 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 and Berardi refers here to prana, Sanskrit term of um, life energy, and in um, East Asia it's also called ki. I previously had like a slide, but oh, maybe, oh yeah. Yeah, so this is the quote. This is key in kanji. 
And uh, rhythm is not measurable. That's the interesting aspect of it for me. And there is always something which evades uh, the capture. So the poet, to connect that again, acts often like the shizo and reveals the infinitude of process making, uh, of the process of meaning making. So you could say this counter waiver is poet and shizo. And they need to become coders, thinkers, as I mentioned already. Maybe you get the idea. Um, important also is this connection between time and reality. So this is then the, 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 the concept of queer theorist Elizabeth Freeman is very interesting and important, um, which she calls chrononormativity, which converts, I quote, historically specific regimes of asymmetrical power, vectorial power maybe, into seemingly ordinary body temples and routines. So they become, these rhythms become kind of normal and obvious. And, and we know, we all know this, um, and also we can um, observe this with the gig economy. And again, you could say, quoting Berardi, um, everything is re reformatted according to the algorithm in the conventional way written. Uh, the vibratory nature of the biorhythm is suffocated. Briefing is disturbed and poetry is frozen, he says. Poetry, which is for him the error that leads to the discovery of new continents of meaning, the excess that contains new imaginations and new possibilities. End of quote. So counter raving is also about kind of defrosting the stiffening and clustering of, and cut, uh, of these, all these categorization effects of algorithms operated on us by profit-oriented and even authoritarian systems. And, um, oops. When the, when the Chong argues something similar alongside referring to homophily. So homophily as a configuration which is enabled by higher Christ social graphs, our links with people, groups, and organizations in a social network. And we, we kind of read, need to um, counterwave again homophily, our love for sameness and strive for difference, right? Which is difficult because usually uh, we like those who are similar to us. But we urgently also need these, these new habitual patterns and preferences. And we need to leave the comfort zone, she says. So I quote, to be uncomfortable then is to inhabit norms differently, to create new ways of living with others, different ways of impressing upon each other, new forms of engagement, different, more inhabitable patterns. So the question really is, also I don't have the answer, but how can we make these new patterns, right? And then you could also say this means to have different time scales, to think about different time scales. So if you go still start with the human, we have like this, um, the mesoscale, which is about the minutes and the seconds um, and hours and days and then above and below, right? And interesting, something like music has also a very broad uh, spectrum of these scales. But counter raving could, could be about music and dance, but it also could be about something more um, invisible, like uh, electromagnetic waves and radio and wireless protocols um, using means such as um, software-defined radio, for example. So this, this kind of technology um, could, you know, you can change the, you can make uh, radio or even more advanced things uh, like uh, um, Wi-Fi or um, other, you can try to make a new protocol, for example, or you can also listen to radio astronomy and so on. This is a very interesting uh, field. But all, they have all sort of something to do with rhythm, in my opinion. So this, this is the, the joint of trying to connect everything. Another concept 
um, is chaosmosis, a term uh, Berardi also refers to, and he borrows from Gattari, which is the, the kind of, um, I quote him, opening of the ordered system, you could say the algorithmic system we have now, to chaotic flows and the osmotic vibration of the organisms that look for a rhythm tuned to the cosmos, end of quote. Therefore, we need to make rhizome with software and algorithms in order to de-stiffen de them to allow that their congested ener energies can flow inwards or outwards and to allow and reprogram them to perform this sort of chaosmosis. In a sort of maybe out-to-date masculine terminology, you could say, inspired by Walter Benjamin, Counterwaving is about blasting open the continuum of history. So, meaning the hardened linear structure of oppressive history, as he already formulated around 1940s in, the, in his famous text on the concept of history. And I said masculine, and since this is really sort of, you could say, aggressive and violent, right? But maybe it's still worth to explore. So, a historical materialist waits for the moment where a historical situation is crystallized, stopped, or at least presented in sort of a time-lapsed slow-motion mode so that, that they can analyze it, reshuffle, recombine, and reconstruct it as it was witnessed by the oppressed and not as written by the powerful as a sort of theological linear continuum of progress legitimating their hegemonic status. This is sort of my paraphrasization of Benjamin's idea. And this sort of activist interpretation of Benjamin gets supported by his reflections on film. As, as it has already become, became obvious through my formulations, film is sort of, you could say, a hidden medium of Benjamin's materialist historian and is for him also a sort of body technology similar to um, Haraway's cyborg which operates in between positive and negative usages. So, he says famously, film renders the performance of an actor into measurable, quantifiable processes of labor, and at the same time, um, alienates them. It, and also, again, at the same time, it enables one to dissect a situation like a surgeon would do during a medical operation. Therefore, a magician is to a surgeon like a painter is to a filmmaker. I quote Benjamin. Um, our bars and city streets, our offices and furnished rooms, our railroad stations and our factories seem to close relentlessly around us. Everything very depressing. Then came film and exploded this prison world with the dynamite of the split second, so that now we can set off calmly on journeys of adventure amongst its, the seconds, far-flung debris, meaning wreckages, remains, and fragments, and with the close-up space expands, and with slow motion, movement, movement is extended." End of quote. So with the camera and the projector, as empower me, empowering media technologies that the activist, activist materialist historian and cyborg, um, similarly to maybe poets experimenting with the alphabet, is able to rewrite, recut, and reconstruct new forms of expressions and evolutionary counterwaving. Um, you could uh, also see this as, as this form of, of um, Maybe there, there was a verb missing, of, of counter-waving. So this is the idea, sorry. And you can see um, this very simple visualization I try to do here. But also, more concretely, you could think about works by, for example, forens forensic architecture for, in this kind of um, conceptional conception because they really try to use different forms of media and, 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 and documentation to really uh, uh, turn, turn the story, turn the main, main story, which is um, and, 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 um, 
create a new story for those who, the, the, the real victims and the, the, those oppressed, right? So um, I could also show, refer to these, to these sort of projects. And, the, and the, for now and for, for today is, is the question, what are the implications of this sort of um, activist approach with kind of using technology um, in context of coding, simulation, data analysis, machine and deep learning. So does deep learning allow us to rewrite histories of oppression or make visible oppressive acts otherwise obfuscated, darkened, hidden by governments? And for our context today, also what are the um, implications of Benjamin's ideas of blasting open the forgotten and hidden for experimenting in adventures uh, in music and art. I think these are very interesting and legitimate uh, questions to pose, and maybe we need to remember them also for the discussion or just to keep them. But instead, I would like to look at the older medium. It was already mentioned a little bit. Um, I mean here literature in order to then come back to coding and the situation today. So a little more than 40 years after Benjamin, looking at the technology of poetry, the early Friedrich Kittler argued that it is the lip, mouth, mouth, tongue, throat system of a pedagogue, often a mother, combined with a certain way to look at and operate with letters on a printed medium, which predetermined the, I quote him, condition of production for classical poetry, end of quote. Focusing on the early 19th century in Germany, Kittler argued that, I quote, poetic texts were on the technological cutting edge because more than any others, they could speak to and exploit alphabetized bodies. They operated on the threshold of response itself where discursive powers paraded as the innocence of bodies and nature, end of quote. So he's trying to criticize this kind of pedag pedagogical way where these kind of power structures um, become implemented, the discursive powers, while teaching reading to children, right? And about 200 years later, our situation is Im unimaginably more complicated, but still we could try to make analogies and ponder about the most prevalent pedagogic situation around the production of code and software including kind of their technocratic and solution-oriented culture. So when our create creativity is striving for poetic code and algorithms as the cutting edge of contemporary technology and production, what are the modes of exploitation linked to our algorithmized bodies we need to be aware of? And to tackle this, this question, you could, as a historian, I would go a little bit Back to history, this is the last part. It's just like some brick stones, bricks, uh, debris that you can, uh, debris that you can then make your own ideas out of, I guess. So in the late 1970s, um, techno-optimists like, um, and hippies like Seymour Parpert, co-founder of the MIT Media Lab, claimed that, I quote him, it is possible to design computers so that learning to communicate with them can be a natural process, more like learning French by living in France than, than like trying to learn it through the unnatural process of American foreign language instructions in classrooms. And that this would motivate children to learn mathematics as a living language, end of quote. And in the 1990s, um, Puppet's idea were obviously adapted by more liberal creatives like John Maeda or later then uh, Casey Rees and Ben Fry into what we all know as um, creative coding tools such as processing Arduino, etc. So they are very good and surely helpful, but we need also to critically inquire what kind of discourses and power concepts, mindsets, they incorporate as um, pedagogic sites of software production, in, especially in the creative realm. So what kind of 
other alternatives, ideas, and concepts got lost in, in between the 1970s or, yeah, and never got, got explored, maybe. This is like an important question. And this, this inquiry could form a basis for a sort of pedagogy um, for counterweaving, uh, as I, I was trying to conjure today. So, 1960s, 70s, and even the 1990s are very inspirational with movements like psychedelics or cyberdelics, but also dangerous for their, uh, for their hedonistic and optimistic side, right? So they, used, they, they are famous for using joy and fun, but um, maybe they didn't change the rhythm too much. So how could we do it similarly but different with the, within today? Because right, we still want to stay hopeful and ironic and not cynical and um, happy. Uh, we want to stay happy, not cynical. So therefore, to close our main circle again, we need, to we need this power of poetry I was trying to mention before and other forms of collective ecstatic aesthetic expression, dreaming and acting, in order to not get captured and frozen. Yeah, and how can we blast open the doomsday scenarios for the next 30 years, or even maybe forget them, but still not forget them fully, that there is always a danger that they might come true. So therefore, let me end again with Radi, with this kind of more dark, futuristic vision, and the, the questions we need to address. So the most urgent question for the next generation is how to be happy in this hell. How to create autonomous spaces of happy survival in this hell. And how can we save and transmit the message of equality and friendship, maybe solidarity also, with the worst, within the worst um, tempest uh, in history unfurls. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Shintaro, for that run-through, frantic run-through, I must say, uh, through a lot of, uh, as you said, building bricks that we can all, I guess, uh, uh, take from and uh, further with our own research and reading um, to explore what you suggest more. Uh, but maybe we have some questions in the audience now that you can um, post to Shintaro. So if, please raise a hand, we have a microphone. Yes, here. Thank you, Shintaro. Um, I missed the ten first minute, so sorry if you already answered my question uh, before I came. Um, the concept of counter-raving, as I understood you, um, is kind of a call for diversity or like something that is working against normativity and all that, and I think, all of us would immediately sign this idea. Um, who's the raver then? Like, is that the opposite of the counter raver? And who's that? Like, the old character of the raver? Because I think we could all sign to that idea of raving and the idea of underground dance cultures were long the idea of working against normativity and the call for diversity was something that was matching with the yeah. idea of underground dance cultures. So I don't really see the opposite mm. there. Yeah, thanks for that question, because, yeah. Yeah, truly, um, I didn't think too much about, in, about that as an opposition. And I wanted to more like emphasize the raving with count, that it's countering something, but not the raver, obviously. But the raver maybe is, if he's more conscious and, or, and yeah, it's different than counter waver sort of, but it's not against. He's not against, or she, or they. They, don't not, they are not against each other. They should work together. But it's like trying to enforce or to emphasize this um, activist um, gesture, I could say. There's also ideas like counterpoint or um, 
encountering. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. So it's just an aware raver, an activist raver kind of. Yes, yes, obviously. I showed in the first there are really like interesting movements now, like this R R3 sound system in the UK where they uh, rave against uh, Brexit, or they, they try to rave against Brexit in November, December, and, and they're all sort of also connected to um, uh, uh, um, um, theorists in at Goldsmiths, uh, uh, yeah, Gottwürgen, Eschron, and uh, what are the, uh, Gold, uh, Gold K, K, K9, um, and this, Steve Goodman. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And I have, if I might, Add another comment, just very quickly. It's, it's rather not a question. I don't have as much input as I wished I had. Um, but um, I think if we think about blowing up history and like, working about against like, um, normative discourses and about like, against white supremacy and all that, we should start, like we as researchers, um, start to quote new voices and uh, like, other um, other researchers, because I, I, I see, like, I always see Kittler and Toulouse, Catherine, like all these names, mm, and I'll okay. like do that my, myself. Like that's, but I think we should really start there too, to yes. like, okay. like let other people in and read up because there is so much out there. Yeah. Um, next to this dominant discourse, we keep repeating. So it's just a comment. Yes. I was trying to do it with Benjamin, but Benjamin obviously also is a known person. But, <laughs> but for me, you know, in my from in my uh, way I went through, I, I never really appreciated Benjamin because yeah, I didn't never understand his, this, his theory with the aura and the, uh, I was like saying no, the aura is not. Im I mean, but it's not. It completely misses his point because. <laughs> He exactly say, uh, tells us the same thing, but uh, yeah. But this this kind of um, post-structuralist and maybe even German media studies um, is is really not. It needs to get connected to what has been done before, which is really Benjamin and Adorno and Horkheimer, and it's still, they are all males. And you know, but maybe this alone is an interesting step. And then you could also draw other researchers like Elizabeth, Elizabeth Freeman and others, right, yeah. Maybe I can just add something to this question. Uh, um, it's a little bit weird to see Kittler being presented in, in this context, considering personally he was quite homophobic if not a uh, sexist uh, individual that luckily didn't operate in a Me Too time, so, so he was not outed for, for kind of this kind of problematic uh, behavior uh, he could have been. Mm. Um, and then see in, in these notes that uh, yeah, he's still present. Yeah. And then on the other side, I'm kind of surprised that uh, these uh, toxic masculinities that operate in these circuit festivals are not uh, presented as like the obvious opposite uh, to counter raver. These apolitical kind of industries of dance cultures that exist, uh, I mean, I think everyone is aware of them and that slowly enter uh, Berlin since I guess 10, 15 years and progressing rapidly even with some institutions that used to be very progressive in, in the dance scene. Uh, so aside from being future looking and a kind of positive and projecting what is possibly to be done, it could be maybe interesting to see what is so wrong in the existing uh, music cultures and then where uh, are these uh, problematic things aside from asking ravers to become more activists. Yeah. I mean, th there is a way to point fingers and not to be only pointing fingers. <laughs> yes, thank you for that, yeah. 
Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I would just like to point out a reference that could be considered more like counter than and it didn't pop. I was expecting it to come, which is Zach Blass, which holds a concept of contra internet. Mm -hmm. He doesn't use con counter, but uses con contra, which comes from the term contrasexual manifesto. And I thought it would be something interesting for the for this discussion is exactly what we mean by introducing counter digital ideas or counter internet ideas to music production, but in his case about networks and communication. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I saw his um, installation, I think in the last last transmission. Um, his video installation, the one one room thing. But I yeah, I should look at yeah, I would I would love to incorporate that a little bit or yeah, thank you. Maybe just to add that. Zach was almost uh, coming here. We were ha working hard uh, on that together with him to have him present a lecture here on that day, actually. But uh, he was too busy at the moment with some exhibition projects. So. Thanks for your talk. I'm curious if you could speak about the sort of almost aesthetic genre of your talk, because it, it was really interesting to me how you how you uh, work with theory and uh, as a, almost a kind of theory DJ, you know, kind of moving between many, many very distinct and as we commented earlier, sort of uh, well-celebrated theorists that have been, you know, read again and again, but you move very quickly from place to place almost as a kind of, uh, you know, visual mode. I, I, so I was curious how you think of it, right? Because a lot of the anchors for you with the concepts that you're working across, not necessarily the behind the scenes work, right? Where these concepts are coming from, what they're doing in the world. Yeah. So it's at this, yeah, I was curious about that aesthetic for you. Yeah, thanks for that, that remark and comment. Um, theory DJ. <laughs> I never thought about that, but it's quite, ob maybe it's obvious. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe the generation I'm, I grew up as a, and as a yeah, I've been DJing also a li little bit. Um, so, and uh, in a in a in a in academic, more academic scholarly work, you would really try to to um, reveal the contexts of maybe one of these these uh, these brick stones or this one one uh, track. And uh, maybe it's distracting. I don't know. It's it's maybe it's not the way to to uh, make um, presentations. So I will need to think about it more deeply. So I will, I, I'm, I'm trying out stuff at the moment, so. Right. So, yeah. If it's not working, then maybe I will try to do something different, but. It's also like this, these screen recordings, they are like kind of ways to reveal also how you work, right? Or how I work, or probably all of us just by Googling and reading stuff and, you know, this is kind of, so this was an attempt. So my, I, I presented this before um, and it was kind of, yeah, criticized that it's really uh, distracting and really not uh, rhythm. It's not changing the rhythm. It's, <laughs> it's all the time the same <laughs> rhythm, basically. So I will try to reflect that more. That's, the reason I was trying to, <laughs> to to address it before, so that this time, so. Um, I have uh, what is two comments. Um, one of them that felt really related to what you're saying. I forget the name of the curator, but he's a Serbian immigrant who lives in Austria that did a exhibition in Vienna called Dances of Urgency, and it was looking at a series of different links between dance, rave culture, and protest movements, and had some really amazing work that I think could also make for fun graphics for your talk. What, what? Volgomir Doranger? It was a really amazing exhibit. Um, and partially related to the, the comment and question about the raver, I'm really interested in these ways in differentiating between a subculture and a counterculture, hmm. and I think they can exist in the same container where like kink community and BDSM can be a subculture that in fact magnifies 
the norms in really problematic ways. But it can also be a counterculture that subverts dominant power modes. And I see this in rave culture and electronic music culture where whether it's the person talking about the like hypermasculine kind of circuit festivals or the ways that clubs can be quite ableist and classist where they have a bunch of stairs and no wheelchair ramps or the entry fee is something people can't afford or there's a lot of sexual harassment happening on the dance floor and it's in fact this incredibly normative capitalist kind of thing but then also the counterpoint of like spaces like Menschmeyer or um, in the Bay Area, uh, around the point of the Occupy movement, people were doing these things they called electro-communist dance parties. And they would have a roving sound system that would be sort of the center point for gathering people for a riot. So it was kind of used as a way to bring people into the crowd who may not otherwise find themselves a, at a riot and create kind of a fun dance party that would kind of evolve and expand into this kind of militant protest. Um, and it's really, in, I, I'm really intrigued in the, this point about if there's the counter raver, what is the raver, and this distinction between subculture and and counterculture. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So it's more like a comment than a question, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the raver is the subculture part, and counter raver could be counterculture. That's what I, yeah. And they could be similar, oh yeah. So it's, it's like, a, it's, it's just an idea to yeah, maybe also do historical research now about the techno culture. And uh, not only historical, but like um, uh, political or uh, materialist histories, uh, and even like uh, queer histories or whatever, uh, to really, yeah, to understand all aspects, all important aspects. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see any further questions, so maybe this is the moment to close the session to thank Mia Shintaro Miyazaki and all of you, and we have another break of about 20 minutes before we continue with the performance by Maria Bozinovska-Jones. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>